Yeah, we are live. What are we at? 701? 702. Just clicked over. I'm going to call that 701. Tonight we are talking about dynamic compression. It's magic, right? You can determine anything. I bring this up because I've gotten a lot of comments about it, and I've gotten a lot of questions about it. Guys are asking, hey, what kind of dynamic compression can I run on my street motor like on pump gas? Like, well, that's a really good question. And I wish I had a really simple answer for you. What they want is, okay, if your dynamic compression is 7.74 to 1 with your combination of static compression and cam timing, you can run on pump gas. But as always, <laughs> there's a lot more to the story than that. So let's talk a little bit first about, about dynamic compression. So most people are familiar with static compression. So static compression basically is the, the difference between the piston at bottom dead center and the piston at top dead center. And you have a ratio of, you know, it's more at the bottom and it's less at the top. And then you're going to have some sort of ratio when you calculate that out. It's going to be 6 to 1, 7 to 1, 8 to 1, all the way up to 15 to 1, just depending on how small this part is at the top and how big this part is at the bottom. That's a static compression. So, you know, for a long time, people would know, and I, and I, this is like the first level of understanding something. So everybody knows that high compression, if you have high compression, you got to run good gas. Look at all of the super high performance motors from the muscle car era. So we had 10 and a half, 11, some of the stuff, let's say it was 12 to one. You know, you look at an L88, it said right on the sticker inside the car, you must run a minimum of whatever the RON number that they gave 106 or 108 or something. So high static compression, you need lots of octane, right? Well, yes and no. I mean, it, it is a good idea if you have big dome pistons and it's going to be a race motor and you should run it on good gas so that you don't, so it doesn't detonate. That's just common sense. <coughs> Excuse me. But the reality is a lot different than that because static compression is the first level. Dynamic compression takes into account that static compression, 10 to 1, 11 to 1, 12 to 1, 8 to 1, whatever your number is, and what's happening with the camshaft. Most prominently, the uh, intake valve events. So I think it's the intake valve closing. So what they're looking at is when you put a wilder camshaft in, you're bleeding off some of that cylinder pressure. We're going to talk about why that might not be happening and how important that is. But the thinking is that, and, and what usually happens is, when you have high static compression, if you run a wild, wilder cam timing, it bleeds off some of that, and then you have a lower effective dynamic compression, and then you can run that on a lower octane fuel, which is absolutely true. I mean, at whatever the detonation threshold, if you can understand that and measure that, if you run wilder cam timing, which is why, and, and we're gonna look at this both ways, like if I take a, We've got a couple of big blocks sitting here. So let's take a big block, for instance. So we got a big block Chevy. And we put a camshaft in it that's, so we'll look at this in reverse first. So we'll put a big camshaft in. Let's say we have an eight to one big block. You know, it was going to be a blower motor. So it made it eight to one. Put a big camshaft in it, 278, 285, 286 at 50. It's a pretty big camshaft, especially when you combine that with it being 780 lift or 800 lift or something. It's a pretty good sized camshaft. Now, a lot of people will tell you right off the bat, Richard, you cannot run that big of a camshaft on an eight to one motor. You absolutely can, and it works just fine. The dynamic compression is gonna be fairly low because you have a combination of low compression and lots of cam timing, but yet it still works and still makes power at the same RPM and does everything that it does. The reason that they tell you that they want, the cam companies tell you that they want you with this big a camshaft, we want you to run 12 to one compression or 13 to one, is not because that cam works better with more compression. Compression is just gonna elevate everything. So whatever the power curve is, when you change the compression from eight to one to nine to one, 10, 11, 12, it's just gonna elevate the whole thing. The reason that they want you to run the high compression is because the that camshaft is going to be soft down low. It's gonna be soft down low, not because of the static compression, it's gonna be soft down low 
because of the valve events. It's a big wild cam. It wants to make power up here. And the, the way that you get a camshaft to make power up here is it doesn't make as much power down here. If you have a lot more static compression, you fill in some of that. And so you can get some of that missing stuff. The reverse of that obviously is also true. And that's what we're talking about, dynamic compression. If you have a high compression big block and you put a big cam in it, you can run uh, less octated. And that's certainly true. But here's my question, and we're going to go in and take a look at some dyno results, and we're going to take a look at what happened on the 3800 V6 because it was supercharged. So we added a camshaft to it. We were running it with a stock cam, very mild. We ran it with a blower. We had good gas in it because we had the 85, and we, and we had no problems. But, and here's the thing, we put a camshaft in. Camshaft did several things, but the one we want to talk about right now to begin with is dynamic compression. It obviously changed the dynamic compression. It made that lower. So did it make that motor less susceptible to detonation from that change in dynamic compression? So what do you guys think? Let, <laughs> let me know. Answer in the comments. Let me know what you guys think. Did putting the bigger cam in, which we know made more power, and we're going to go take a look at that, it did make more power, and it made more power everywhere. It definitely lowered the dynamic compression because of the valve event change. We, it was a wilder cam compared to the stock one. Did we reduce the chance of detonation by putting that camshaft in? We need to think about that. The reason that we need to think about that is, well, let's go in and take a look at the, we'll go in and take a look at the power curves now. Un unplug this for a second, make sure I got enough. Yeah, we got plenty of juice in here. I want, I want to go in and have you guys look at the power curves. We're going to talk about a couple of other things. Because even though we made that change, dynamic compression wasn't the only thing that changed when we did that. So we're going to take a look. I'm going to scoot you over here so you can kind of see. I'll get you zoomed in here. Get you adjusted. So can everybody see that? Okay, everybody should be able to see that, right? Everybody, everybody say yes. I think the image is pretty good. Okay, so here we have our supercharged 3800 and we have it, the black line down here and here, this is horsepower and torque, is with the stock cam. The red lines are the horsepower and torque curves when we put the camshaft in. So here's my question. We lower the dynamic compression, but this motor now makes a lot more torque and a lot more horsepower. So did we change the detonation threshold from lowering the dynamic compression? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Let's take, let's take a look at also what else happened when we did this. So now we have not only more horsepower, which we expected because it's wilder cam timing. When I say wild, it's, it's still pretty mild. But we made a lot more torque, made more torque everywhere. So with more torque comes more cylinder pressure. With more cylinder pressure becomes greater sensitivity to detonation. So while we've changed the dynamic compression, and which should help us with that, we've also increased the cylinder pressure which hurts us. So which one of those is going to play a bigger role? So you guys can comment and let me know what you think there. The other thing that we did here, which is also very important, which is why I, when everybody asks me about dynamic compression, I tell them, yeah, it's an indicator. It's a correlation, but it's not a causal effect with the detonation threshold. There are too many other things that are going on. The other thing that happened when we did this, when we put the camshaft in and, and made more power, you know, we picked up a fair bit of power. Um, the peak power went from 342 to 382. So we picked up 40 horsepower with the camshaft. The other thing, and we, and we made a lot more torque, as you can see everywhere. But the other thing that happened on the supercharged combination is we lowered the boost pressure. I think three or four pounds in this case. So lowering the boost pressure has a positive effect on the detonation threshold because when we lower the boost pressure, 
we lower the charge temperature. Charge temperature is another one of those things that can cause detonation, irrespective of the dynamic compression, irrespective of the cylinder pressure, just all by itself. So we have a couple things that are helping us with the detonation sensitivity of this motor and one of the things that might be hurting us. Now, in our case, on this particular motor, we don't have to worry about any of those <laughs> because we had a safe tune in it. We had the motor was cold. We had E85. We weren't running a ton of boost. I think that this was, I don't know, 11 or 12 pounds or something by the time we were done after we put the camshaft in it. So the big things like the tune and the octane and all that, all, all of those things were right. The other things, as I look at them, are kind of secondary. And this isn't even all of them. This is just a couple of things to talk about. So we had a change in charge temperature. We had a drop in boost. We had a change in dynamic compression. We had a change in cylinder pressure. The other things, and I mentioned those a little bit when we were talking about it. The other thing to think about is you can also um, change the water temperature in the head. You change the water temperature in the head, you definitely change the detonation threshold. Just like the air temperature, change the water temperature of the motor, whatever you're running the motor at, you'll definitely change the thing. You can also change it with chamber shape. We can go into later on when I do an interview with Brian Tooley, we can talk about uh, softening the chambers and the effect that has on the detonation threshold. It allows you to run more timing. Therefore, whatever timing level you're at, it's going to be safer. The material that you have of the cylinder head. Aluminum versus iron. There's this age old discussion and, and argument that cast iron heads make more power because they don't let out all that heat. One thing we do know is that an aluminum head is going to be uh, make the motor less sensitive to detonation or less susceptible to detonation than an iron head is. So we have a lot of things that can affect the, affect the detonation threshold. And that's one of the reasons why when I get a lot of these comments about dynamic compression, Obviously, I understand it and know what it does. I don't have a real, like I'd have to, I'd have to test like 100 or 200 vehicles actually out on the street that were similar where we could change only that. The problem is it's hard to change only that. As you see, when we change that, sometimes other things happen. On an NA motor, it wouldn't, there wouldn't be as many changes. But you'd have to run through a series of them and make sure that the water temperature was the same, that the air temperature was the same, that the timing was the same and then go through and change dynamic compression with different camshafts, you'd also have to be able to monitor and have very accurate and repeatable knock detection to find out what that sensitivity is and how much you've adjusted it. A lot of guys are doing this with boosted motors, not, not as often I think with NA motors, although it, the effect is still the same. If you put wilder cam timing in an NA motor, you should theoretically be able to run, you know, more timing and and have less of, less of a chance of detonation. I'd like to see the actual testing that would have to go into that to satisfy my curiosity about that being the only change. Because as I said, you know, in the supercharged deal, we definitely changed changed dynamic compression, but we also changed a lot of other things that can have both a positive or and or a negative effect on the detonation. So when somebody tells you, yeah, if you lower it down to below eight to one dynamic or seven and a half to one or whatever the magic number is, um, just know that unless somebody has done an inordinate amount of testing on that particular combination and your combination is identical in all respects, <laughs> um, otherwise it would be very hard to determine that that's actually the case. This was a cool test and I'm very excited about getting this uh, 3800 back up on the dyno which is why I was running around all day today, went over to see um, Gary over at Mahova's place and talked to him about the design of the adapter plate for the 2.2 so we could get that going. Spent most of the day um, at the wrecking yard, which was awesome. Get, get you zoomed back in. <laughs> Look, I'm not tall enough. So let's see here. There we go. So today was a lot of running around. I had to get the gaskets for the 3800. We had to get another, I had to get another 
into or a blower gasket between the blower and the intake manifold for the L67. I have the one for the for the other one for the L32. I had to pick up the bell housing, which was over at Mahobitz's because I was letting him use the 3800 V6 um, bell housing as the back half for the adapter plate as the pattern that goes on the dyno. And then he has the 2.2 one over there. I just took him over a replacement side to pick this up so we could try to run this. I was hoping to get it on tonight, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Now I can't find the flywheel bolts. <laughs> so I might have to get new ones. If anybody knows if there are any 3800 guys out there, if you know what the thread pitch is on the, on the going into the crank to bolt the flywheel on, let me know because I, I need to all have to just go get rather than try to continue and search for hours. I need to just go get another set of bolts for it which should not be too hard. We got McFadden Dale's right around the corner or, or, you know, a few miles away and they've got a lot of stuff. So hopefully they'll have, if it's, it's not a weird thread pitch, um, we'll be able to go pick that up and get that going. Um, I also went to my storage and picked up uh, another 3800 series two, the L67 blower. Cause what I'm going to do is cannibalize it and make a manifold out of it so we can also run it in a, I want to include that in the test. And that's part of what I was doing over my trip to the wrecking yard. And you'll see I'm doing a video on that because you know, every day at the wrecking yard is freaking awesome. That's reason enough to go there. But I went over there for actually two specific reasons, not just to go over a window shop, although we know I do that as well. But on my truck, on my Silverado, I had a couple of things break on it. One was the door latch to open the rear you know, small door on the passenger side. So I went over to the wrecking yard specifically to get that. And after five or six, I found five or six different Silverados there um, of my year or that body style. And, and they were all gone. One of them was there and it was broke, <laughs> but all the other ones were gone. So apparently that's a fairly popular item. Lots of people breaking that and going over the wrecking yard. I thought I would just be able to meander over there and without any problem. The other part that I went to get for my car or for the truck, I knew was not going to be there because I've been there looking at that before. And that's the, um, the grab handle inside that's, uh, you know, part of the door, part of the um, door panel. Whenever I go to the wrecking yard, I, we just look in there. The, all the stereo buttons are gone, all the knobs, and all of the door panels are always gone. The door panels and that handle are, all, are always gone. So I got to get another door handle. I took it off. And because I, I have repaired the one on the driver's side and I just made a metal brace and a backing plate and everything and, and secured all that. And it worked good. And it's lasted for a really long time. It's lasted more than a year now and it works good. The other one's broke now and I took it apart. And thought, oh, I'm just going to do the same thing. But it's actually beyond repair. <laughs> I can't weld plastic. I, I know people can, but um, I can't do that. So I'm going to have to I'm just going to have to bite the bullet and get a new one and or or even one from ebay or something i can get that and fix that so i can give my truck some love the other thing i tried to do is well i did a, a point of purchase uh or display purpose when i was at um, napa getting some oil and stuff because i'm going to change the oil in the truck but while i was standing in line i thought you know what that truck doesn't have a um it has a a, a ratty ass steering wheel because it's you know it's really old it's been sitting in the sun a lot and so somebody put a cover on it, but the cover now is just falling apart. Every time I grab onto it, pieces come off my hands. So it's like, you know what? I'm, it's about time. I deserve it. I work hard. I'm going to step up and get a new cover. <laughs> I'm not going to get a fluffy one, but I was going to get one that was kind of like on right now. It makes it look like the regular steering wheel. And I went to put it on, but I got one that's just way too small. <laughs> so apparently there are different sizes for those steering wheels. And I just grabbed one because it was, it was sitting right there where, where I could check out. So we got that stuff. And so I'll have to put, uh, the, you know, I'll have to re replace that and put it back on. But I got the stuff that I needed, got the, um, the blower gaskets. And then I got the other blower so I can, you know, take the, take the rotor pack out and make a, an intake manifold. But the other reason, the third reason that I went to the wrecking yard is um, because I wanted to look for all the intake manifolds for the NA deals. So I went over there and we did a, I did a video on that. Like I said, that's coming out. But I went over and walked around and went through all of the, I, I went through every row because I do that every time I go there. For, you're going to go there. I, I might as well look at everything. Look at all of the, of the cool, like weird older cars that they have there. And then I, you know, look through all the import stuff and look through all the trucks, 
because I was looking for my panels and then went and looked through the, all the domestic stuff because they have it. It's all haphazard there. It's not, it's not just all the Pontiacs are right here and the Forge right here. So I went and looked through and, and stopped at a bunch of them and did videos on the different intakes, different intake manifolds. And it looks like from what I found today, I, I only really saw two different ones. Um, there's a composite one and aluminum one in the front wheel drive stuff. And I didn't see any of the rear drive Camaro Firebird 3800 stuff. I, I'd like to get one of those too, but I didn't see any at this wrecking yard. So maybe I'll have to source one of those from another place. And I was just looking while I was there, while I was doing recon to find out what was there and what was available and stuff that I could get. I also took a look at you know, so I could take a look around at all the bolts and everything that's connected to it and stuff. So I could do some, um, you know, pre-staging on what kind of tools I'm going to need when I go over there. Obviously, you know, you try to take everything over there and then you always, oh, if I only had whatever thing is that you're missing, um, that always happens. But having worked on these 3800s now uh, for a couple of days, we can kind of see, you know, what needs to take place. I'm just hoping that taking it out and, and accessing everything with the motors in the car, you know, won't be too much more difficult. Um, you know, some of the stuff we might not be nice to because we're not going to use it. But I have to pull the, when I pull the intake manifolds, we want to get everything. We want to get obviously the lower intake manifold, the upper intake manifold, the throttle body and stuff. Some of these later ones, like the later one, the aluminum one, is going to be a drive wire by wire throttle body. So we're either going to have to convert it to manual um, like we did with the L32 deal. Um, which is not a big deal, or if, or if I don't know if the pr probably the earlier throttle bodies will not bolt on. Um, so we'll have to, you know, we'll have to solve that problem. But if I get everything, then when we run it, I just have to, you know, kind of plop it on there. And, and uh, the other thing, if I get everything, I can use the injectors to plug the holes because when we have the supercharged heads and the NA intake manifold, then basically we have two sets of injectors and we want to you know, I, you can't have big holes in there, but I will run them all NA and then see what happens. And then, then we'll decide what to do with turbo stuff. But that test is a, a little while down the road because I got a lot of supercharged stuff to do beforehand. And before we can do that, we just need to make sure that the motor is just okay. And then while with those other manifolds, with those other factory manifolds, um, I'm just going to add the you know blower casing basically and the short runner manifold that came with the supercharger to kind of see I, I, if it, if, and I'm sure we can get it to work. What I'm hoping is to illustrate what happens when you have a dramatic change in runner length and it's going to do the same thing. It always does. You guys know, you guys have seen this cause I've tested it many, many times. Um, but I'll, what, what I will be interested to see in that one is, is there, there a crossover point? Will that short runner blower manifold blowing through the blower casing, will it ever make more power than these other long runner deals? So that, that'll be interesting. And I'm also going to try to um, airflow test the V6 head tonight. I wasn't able to get to it last night. We were just, I just had too much stuff going on. You know, too, too busy chatting with you guys. Uh, Bobby, thank you for cold snacks. Those are the best kind. Little ice, little friendliness. And I also... While I was at the auto parts store, because I tried to do lots of things, um, got head gaskets for the the Magnum. And today, and part of last night, I also disassembled the Hemi. And we 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 can go over and take a look at that real quick because <laughs> uh, it's pretty exciting. So you guys can look at some of these. David, thank you very much. Look at some of these, uh, some of the engine masters motors and stuff. I'm going to grab a piston for you guys. <laughs> so here you go. Here's what was left of the Hemi. <laughs> Nice, huh? Look at that. All kinds of fancy. And as you might imagine, uh, there's an attending hole in the block. We're going to go take a look at that. So over and 
show you why. So here's all of the uh, Hemi parts as parts. So here we go. So you can see. Oh yeah. It's not really good, right? Shouldn't be able to see in there. Look. And here you can kind of see what's going on. I get a good lighting angle for you. Kind of need a flashlight to see in there. I was hoping the camera would adjust. Basically broken rods and stuff, you know, your usual. And a big old hole in the block. Let's see. Yeah, got some windage trade damage as well. So that's uh, that's not bueno. And this is the uh, L32 damaged one. Bad bearings. <clears throat> but it did well while we were testing, though. We got a lot of good information. Cam stuff, blower stuff, E85, compound turbo stuff, you know. So it uh, it served us well. So I'm, I'm excited now to see what's going to happen with the L67, obviously whether it's a actually a runner or not. And also... Um, is it going to make, you know, is it going to make more power? Is it, how, how is it going to compare to the, uh, to the L32 when we put it on, you know, was the L32 down? We don't know that. Um, it will be interesting to see what happens. Let's take a look at my camera. Don't know if I uh, touched it and got grease on it. <laughs> Yep, cooling vents in the Hemi. Hey. Got the cam. Make sure I took the camshaft out of the 3800 before we send it on its way. But yeah, so you can see it's been a um, been a busy day. The cool thing is when I was at the wrecking yard, I'm, and I this will be in the video, is I did find a couple of other Hemis that were there. So I'm uh, I'm wanting to get one of those. Little JB Weld. I still have most of the parts. <laughs> the uh, oil pan was full of them. It's like chunky style. Will the Hemi rod hold more power than a Gen 4 LS rod? No. I don't think so. Uh, I've never made what we made with the um, with a Hemi. I've never made that with an uh, or with the LS. I've never made that with a Hemi. Uh, ben, I, your question is, can you port your 706 heads and make as much power as the AFR heads? It depends. The, the turbo is ultimately going to determine how, how much power you can make. So if you, and we've talked about this many times, is if you have a 700 horsepower turbo, I wouldn't buy heads for it. Just put stock ones on it. I wouldn't even port them. Same thing with a thousand horsepower turbo. I, I wouldn't even port the heads. You don't need to, because you're only going to make a thousand horsepower. The turbo is going to see to that. The the heads are just going to determine like what boost level you do that at. If you're trying to make a million horsepower, you need good heads. Uh, what was happening with the Hemi when it broke? That was totally my fault. You can't see it now, but it had Edelbrock aluminum heads on it. And the Edelbrocks um, have a little pipe plug that goes in them. That's how they make the heads symmetrical. They could bolt on either side. One of them has to be plugged. And so, long story short, <laughs> the bottom end of the motor filled up with water. And when it did, it reversed hydrolock. <laughs> That's why that piston broke, <laughs> because it was my fault. So, you know, you live and learn.
<laughs> Can I build your suburban? No, I'm not. That's not something I'm interested in. David on the West Coast here may have an F body intake that I would loan. Also, HV3 inserts for the plastic and aluminum intakes. Uh, David, I'm going to put my email address down and thank you very much. That would be cool if I could borrow that stuff. So there's my email address. <laughs> Deshroud the valves. Deshrouding valves does help. We, I've shown that quite a bit by and by 12 or 13 CFM, it's quite a bit. I want to do a 5.3 LS1, but I don't know how to make 500 horsepower. Very hard to do with a 5.3 with an NA1. Easy to do with boost. Demon Tech, thank you very much. Uh, been gone for a while, working on a few projects, finishing an S10 and prepping for the... Of a grand national, cool. <laughs> That's the other thing that people do. Admiral just mentioned that uh, nine to one should be safe on 87 octane, so we know that 87 is good for over 130 psi cranking pressure. So is there a, is there a correlation between cranking compression and detonation sensitivity? Is there a correlation between cranking compression, and dynamic compression. Uh, have you ever built a Chrysler Powertech 4.7 liter? I have not. Uh, Ogi Speed, we've done a good bit over 1,000 horsepower with a stock bottom end on a Hemi, as long as you put ring gap in it. We know that they'll go there. Uh, a lot of things, a lot of... Um, the reason why a lot of people were saying that these Hemis were fragile and the pistons were junk and are made of glass and all that is because there was two reasons. One, they weren't putting ring gap in them. They were running the factory ring gap, which is tight. And also the, those pistons do have a smaller ring land, but that wasn't the problem. The, the problem was the ring gap and then the lack of available tuning back in the day, especially they would just put boost to them. <laughs> boost and fuel usually, which they would augment, augment with a secondary fuel source. And you can't do that. You have to tune it. It has to be, it has to take away timing too. Lee, we've run boosted nitrous uh, often and it works good. Turbos love it. So Ben, there's two different versions of the F body one. Are you going to put ARP rod bolts in the 3800? I was not going to. Because then it wouldn't be a stock bottom end if we're going to continue with the stock bottom end theme. Uh, nothing's happened with the Big Bang K24 yet. I haven't run it. I haven't, we haven't turned the boost up. It's only made 600 and whatever horsepower. I have tested L29 heads a lot. I've run them a lot, but I've not compared them to a 781. Yeah, Mike, that's that's definitely true that early Hemis drop valve seats. I was worried the whole time I was running mine because we had never done anything to the seats on those heads and they were really old. They were from an 04 or 05 or 06 maybe. Yeah, you can spray a lot of nitrous. We ran 300 shots on the junkyard LS stuff. You need to do a series where you run all the boosted engines on 91. I don't normally run stuff on 91. It's too scary. Okay, so they changed throttle bodies in, in inlets. Um, kind of like they did with the Series 2 and Series 3 3800 transverse stuff, right?
132 PSI is nine to one. That that's actually not true. I mean, your nine to one motor may crank at 132 PSI, but there are other ways to get 132 PSI cranking. That's not nine to one. Yeah, cranking compression changes, uh, Racer D, that's a good point, that it changes with head flow. Um, <laughs> I remember somebody yelling at me, chastising me when we were doing cranking compression about not having, one guy yelled at me for not having the throttle all the way open when we were doing the cranking compression test. The other one yelling at me because I, uh, for not having it closed and, you know, because everybody does it their own way. It's not, um, <laughs> it gets to the same point because I've done that test. Paul, the only thing that happens is you have to run less timing and you make less power. If you don't have E85 and you run it on pump gas, you're going to run like I know uh, with Matt over at Sloppy, he likes the 14 and 14 numbers that you can run 14 pounds of boost. I think he runs 93 because a lot of other states have 93. In California, we only have 91. But he runs 14 pounds of boost at 14 degrees of total timing. And that's the most timing that it has. He I need to ask him if he has less timing at the torque peak, which I would imagine he would. But that kind of gives you an idea. Whereas normally, like with E85, especially at 14 pounds, your number would probably be closer to 20 degrees. And so you would make a lot more power with the extra timing. So that's the only thing that pump gas does to you is it makes you take away the timing. And I I wouldn't change the air fuel on pump gas. I'd still run it at, you know, 11, 2, 3, 4, whatever. Uh, James, Richard, do you see the piston rings? Do I see them where? I saw the Hemi ones were laying on the ground. Well, Jeff, that, and that's the problem with people. They want to, I, I don't want to run race gas and I don't want to run, I can't run E85, and I have to run 91, but I want to make as much power as I can. What's the maximum I could make? And I don't even talk to those people <laughs> because those are not the same thing to me. Um, you know, you're, you're going to turn it up till it breaks, and it might break for some other reason that's not related to the amount of boost you ran and the amount of octane that you had and the amount of timing that you had. Could be water temperature, could be air temperature, could be a lot of things. Will the thinner, what thinner rings are you talking about? Oh, okay, Admiral, I, I thought you were saying nine to one was the static compression based on 132 PSI of cranking compression. You know if you can run E85 in a Holly Super Sniper? I don't, I don't know what a Super Sniper throttle body is. If it's one of the throttle body injections and it has standard kind of injectors in it, there should be no reason why you can't run E85 through it. Because the injector doesn't really care about that as long as it's big enough. Uh, Sanders, we ran an LQ4, a 2000 in fact, it's from Chad's, it's 99 or 2000. Um, and that one went to 1,482 horsepower. So you could certainly run a thousand horsepower with that. I don't do any diesel. We don't do any diesel testing on the engine dyno. Cam timing also affects cranking compression.
Yeah, Hard Rock. When I when we when I put together big blocks, whether it's a, you know I got one from a 540 from the guys at Blueprint, and that was already low compression. But when I build one, I normally make it at 10 or 10 and a half to one because it will make enough power NA. I don't want to make it 12 and a half to one and have it be a dedicated thing. And and Brule always tells me, look, if you're going to make it 12 to one, you should make it 15 to one because it already has enough static compression in it where it's going to be problematic on pump pump gas anyways, unless you have the right dynamic compression. Um, he said, just put compression in it. Don't put a little bit of, if you're going to put compression in it, put a lot of compression in it and make it a compression motor. Otherwise don't do it. And so I, I run them like a 10 to one, which is something you can run on 91, run around on the street, especially if you have a good size cabinet, which we do and make power. But then you can also run boost on it. If you run E85 on a 10 to one big block, you can run a, you know, a 12 or 1300 horsepower um, pro charger like an F1 A94. We run a 671 or an 871. We run nitrous on it. We run a turbo on it, and that seems to work really well. You know, I know that uh, if a guy's building a boat motor and I was going to be running it for minutes at a time at wide open throttle, I might put lower compression in it because I'd be much happier if the motor continued to run, and even if I gave up 50 or even 100 horsepower, and the motor went out and lasted like year after year after year, I'd be much happier about that. Dome pressure refers to putting pressure on the um, top side of the wastegate. Yeah, Tim, I think that when they crank, if you're not trying to start them and you just crank them, the cam timing stays fixed but I don't know if you're actually trying to start them if they're varying that. I don't think that they would under cranking. Yeah, Admiral, an iron-headed 12 to one motor would be um, a 91, especially if it's hot outside, would be problematic. All, all of the blueprint engines that I've ever run, we've run that 540. We ran an NA 540. I think that they've run a 565 here at West Tech. We ran a 400 with Chad. I've run a number of 383s and other things. And uh, I think a 408 LS and an LS3. And uh, everyone I've ever run here has, has worked like, like we expected it to. So, Michael, you want to do a valet tune? Um, a valet tune would be lots of timing pulled out of it and then a really early rev limiter. So put a 3,000 RPM rev limiter on or 3,500 or something. Yeah, a five-liter Mustang, it definitely if it was running at temperature, would um, you definitely get detonation at 87. I run 87 in my truck all the time, but then I very rarely am I in the throttle a lot. Like if I'm driving the 450 mile an hour, 450 mile, 450 mile an hour, that would be nice. Then I get home in an hour, 450 mile trip. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm just cruising. If I'm, if I'm towing a trailer with it, then I put good gas in it, especially if I'm gonna be going over hills. James, is it beneficial to put half-inch head studs in an LS? No, you don't need those. The if you the standard head studs hold a lot, way more power than you don't have to worry about the head stud stretching. If you're worried about that, get a CA625 7 16th head stud like we did on the Big Bang motor, and that was 1540 and 1300 foot pounds or something. So the head stud is not the issue. So Admiral, he went right to the bottom of the page then, right? Uh, William, do you think that the new ZZ 
632 is worth the price. I don't know how much it costs. I have no idea how much stuff like that sells for because I know that I would never buy one. <laughs> Yeah, fascist, that's a good point. The oil pressure is probably too low to operate them. Yeah, the roadkill guys have run the blueprint stuff a lot. 37,000 for that 632. I mean, the, the, the thing that's nice about um, the GM stuff is they put a lot of, they put a lot of effort into their stuff and, and, and they do a lot of testing with it, which a lot of places don't. Ben, thank you very much. Let's put together a Richard Holder no prep. <laughs> Truck, trans, rear end. So what do you need? You need a motor for that? I, I see what those no prep races are. And those are really big power and really big, like expensive motors and those things. Uh, will you help me tune my 18 focus with a turbo at 10 pounds? It's a 2018? And I, I don't tune factory ECUs if that's what that is. The can that we put in the, let's see if this is it. This was a uh, 510 lift, a 210, 220 duration, and 115 lobe separation angle. It was just, it was a cam from Comp. Yeah, the new Corvette motor looks impressive. I've not tested any of the Howard stuff. We may have run Howard's cams here, but not any of the rotating assemblies that I can remember. Thousand horsepower motors are pretty easy to do. I don't know how many passes they make because I don't ever take these things out and drag race them. Mackenzie, this will be interesting. David Visard talked about rounding the bottom of the cylinders to allow crankcase pressure to move out of the way. So is he is he wanting to radius the bottom of the cylinder? I don't know that. I don't know. David's a pretty sharp guy. But I don't know if that's the, is that the only cause of crankcase pressure? It's the downward movement of the piston. They're wanting the air to go to the side instead of down. So it's not reflecting back or something. If you have a texted block, you can run any amount of power to that. This cam is an off-the-shelf cam for the 3800. Very rarely do I put custom cams in anything because it's not necessary. What's the most NA power you've made out of a 5.3? I think 5, 505 or 510 or something. That was on a stock bottom end and not on a built 5.3. It was just a junkyard bottom end that we put heads cam and intake on. This, this motor needs more camshaft and this is, this is really mild. It needs a 224, 232, like the Extreme Energy 274 cam because every motor needs that um, or something even bigger. There, there's no, we can talk about anything that doesn't have to be the subject matter. I haven't done anything with a seven MGTE Toyota, but I would like to.
Let's see, I wanted to read the girdle question. Does a girdle help with bottom end strength on aluminum LS1? No, I think it's the block structure is the problem. I think it's the sleeve strength. But a girdle can't hurt. Yeah, Dan, that was my thinking when I heard that. <laughs> I, I love David. He's a great guy. He does have some off-the-wall theories, and that I, I like listening to him, and it would be kind of cool to test some of them. Stage 5 from ZZP. I looked at some of their cams for turbo motors, and they seem to be more uh, toward the single pattern into the spectrum. Yeah, Tucker, that's why there's communication in the Gen 4 motor that wasn't in the Gen 3. They do have, even now people complain that the LS motor has that issue, um, even with those. But you just want to have enough room for the, um, for this, the pulsing to move around. The ideal thing is to compartmentalize each, each one of them and have scaven stages from your dry sump to make sure that you don't have to worry about any of that. Does anyone know if there are aftermarket turbo headers for a Cleavor small block Ford build? Isn't that going to be chassis specific? Stage one from intent. <coughs> 512 to 523. I don't really care about the lift. The fact that one's 510 and one's 520 is pro probably won't even show up on the dyno. Um, the duration is the thing that I would be concerned with. Well, Admiral, the, um, there are aluminum blocks that you can run all the power on, just not the LS1. You can run it on the L33 and the LC953s, but not on any of the 6-liter or 6.2 or 5.7 LS1 blocks. We don't ever run lots of power with those because the sleeves are not nearly as thick. I wouldn't run an aluminum one for very long at 1,000 horsepower, aluminum LS1. You'd be better off to just get a 5.3, either an iron one or an aluminum one. They have aluminum versions of that, like I just mentioned, the L33 and the LC9. And I think that there's another one, too. So Ben, you need a junkyard 5.3 with an S480 turbo on it. A cam 5.3 with a turbo on it would make a thousand horsepower less than or less than 20 pounds. William, happy to help, man. Let me know if you have any questions. Cameron, yes. You can adjust the boost with a knob, <laughs> with a boost controller. There are manual boost controllers that you can just turn. It just opens up a bigger bleed, basically. We don't ever run more than a thousand horsepower on an aluminum LS1. And I don't even remember doing that on an LS1 actually, only on the LS2 and LS3 blocks. Scott, yes, the duration is the thing that for me, for me it's intake duration. The exhaust also obviously plays a part. 
the duration is for me what makes the cam big or not. Not so much the lift. If you, you can make you can make a 600 lift cam that has stock duration specs, and it will operate like you just put rockers on a stock cam, um, because it doesn't matter that it's 600 lift because it's just not staying open long enough to really fill the cylinders. And so duration to me is the big thing. The lift is going to go along with it. With any any sort of performance LS cam, you can have 210, 220, 230. Is that's that gets in kind of the range of most of the stock bottom end stuff. And then they're all going to be usually, some of them will be 550 lift. Most of them will be up near 600. Does the piston slop in 5.3 lose oil pressure? No, the the piston slop is the wall of the the cylinder and the, the piston moving in the wall or moving in the, the, uh, the skirt of the piston moving in the cylinder. Uh, why not run a turbo desk on a Ford 3.7? It would be cool to run all the motors that I ever find, but there's there isn't time and there is there aren't resources to do that. Three seven will do what every other motor does when you add boost to it. Whatever the power curve, that if you've seen the power curve from a stock one, like on a chassis dyno, and you add boost to that, you can just multiply it. Like take that number, whatever you saw, and then um, double it, and that's what it will do at fourteen and a half pounds. If a lot of other things are going right, uh, I've done a lot with D sixteen Hondas. I wrote a couple of books on Hondas and have and have run lots of d16 stuff both with superchargers and nitrous and and a turbo safe on 91 thermostatted to 170. <laughs> Yeah, with those cams, I don't think that'll be a problem, Admiral. The, um, are you putting, okay, you're putting a single chain on it. Whether it has a tensioner on it or not is usually dictated by the block that you're using. Um, five threes don't have them, four eights, even, even six liters don't have them. Um, the later stuff does. LS2s have the little block in the middle of them. LS3s have an actual tensioner on it. If you look at any factory or aftermarket LS timing chain setup, it's going to have a lot of slop in it. And I don't know if that, somebody told me way back that they do that to make it easy to install by a robot. <laughs> People aren't putting those together. I think a robot's doing that. Uh, I don't know if that's true or if that's just an internet myth. Um, and then the tensioner takes up that slack. But I've, I went through this many, many times and, uh, in fact, designed something to fix that. And uh, every chain, every combination of gear and everything that I ever tested had lots of slop in it. Do you recall the power the LS6 made on the dyno stock one? So it depends on what year it is because they were rated differently. But I could go back and look. I've never had an LS6. Um, I think that the guys from Hot Rod did, though. I don't know if you can put the uh, a carburetor and run that and still control your electronic... Um, Transmission. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what signals it needs. <coughs> At what point is too much duration on the camshaft? Um, when it starts to not make power through the part of the curve that you want it to be in. You can keep pushing duration up and make it's going to want to make power higher and higher but at some point you know if you have a long runner intake manifold on it all you're doing is killing bottom end and you're not adding anything, anything at the top uh 
Jeff, the things you should do to avoid de detonation, um, good octane, intercooler, cold air going into the turbo if you have a turbo on it, um, water temperature, and tune. Make sure you have a big enough fuel pump and fuel injectors. And somebody mentioned knock sensors. If you're running with a factory ECU and it has knock sensors, that's a good idea. South Australia, 2.31 p.m. C. nice. You're actually a time traveler. Uh, what's the most you've made? I, I haven't ever tried to break any kind of record on them. Um, I remember the guys coming over from one of the Honda places around here, and I think that they turned it up to 350-ish or something at the tire. Which boosted engine surprised you? The the four eight that we did early on was the most surprising thing. Not that it did something out of the formula. I mean, it followed the formula, but it just made a lot more power than we thought on the stock bottom end. Now you're not going to add boost to that motor, right, Admiral? Guys run 11 to 1 with 91, but you have to have really good um, knock sensors and stuff. I don't know what year they went to serpentine stuff. Did they have serpentine stuff back on the um, on the tune port stuff? Was that serpentine? All right, Ben, get some sleep. Yeah, stage three on a four eight's a lot of camshaft. What's a safe horsepower stock five? Well, if you you shouldn't be trying to boost a stock five liter, you should do other things to it. I mean, you can add boost to a stock one. It's just that you're starting out with so little power that the boost is not going to help that much. Um, Chris, that depends an awful lot on the how big the motor is and how much power it makes, how much fuel it wants, and the specific injector that we, you'd be using. Some of them will allow you to go down really, really low um, on the milliseconds of pulse width. Uh, some of them are designed for that. Some of them don't like it at all. So it's gonna depend more on the actual injector that you use rather than just the size. I just was taking a look at an L83 today and I don't remember looking at the um I don't remember looking at the front dress assembly. non-ethanol fuel benefit? I don't understand the question. LS1, LS9, cam turbo. Uh, I don't ever recommend the LS9 cam chef for a turbo. It's cheap and it makes a lot of power on the top end, but it's pretty soft down low. So I don't think you'd be happy with what it does to the spool rate of the turbo. Paul, the, um, the stall speed of the converter is not going to be a function of the turbo. It's going to be a function of your camshaft. So if you have a stock cam and you put a turbo on it, you'll still have the stock converter and stock stall speed. The stall speed might actually go up a little bit because you're adding a lot of power to it, which would be normal. 
but you don't have to put a different stall speed in it. Uh, you can run a throttle body injection as a blow through like you do with a carburetor. Uh, Gene, you have a 3.7 liter motor and just tell me how much power you want to make and we'll size your turbo up. Dan says, yes, the crossfire had serpentine. Is there a horsepower benefit to running a non-ethanol fuel if you're running NA? In our test, I didn't see any gain from E85 versus 91 that we run here. I don't know. I've tested it against anything else. I think the engine masters guys may have. The 3800 heads are going to be ported. And we are putting bigger valves in it. We're going to put... Um, Probably a 1900, I think, and a, and a 155 or a 157. Six hundred horsepower. Uh, 3800. Well, you probably could do that with a GT3582, I would think, if it's 600 flywheel horsepower. Yeah, Darren, if you're adjusting the, you'll pick up gains from. E85 or other different octanes, but you're not picking that up from the fuel. You're picking that up from the change in timing. And so if you, if you don't have enough timing in it and you add timing, that's just like adding timing. <laughs> What's the most power you got out of a 305? I think 370 or 380 is some, is, we just put a set of trick flow heads on it and a mild cam and a, you know, a, a dual plane intake manifold. Uh, I, Dan, I don't know. I need to talk to the guy who's going to port the heads. I don't know what the throat size is right now. Yeah, if you're running very high ambient temperatures, 85 is good. And we see a little bit of gain on some of the NA motors with the 85. And sometimes we see some gains down low, but usually not near the peak. The exception to that has been the, um, the Coyote and also the Gen 5 LT motors. Charles, I think I'm going to order a... 2.5 pulley for it. What would be an ideal camshaft spec for a Big Bang 3800? Uh, I'll let you know after I see what happens with the intake manifolds, because I just want it to run at the right engine speed. But something that's going to be like a 228 to 34, 36, or even something in the 230s. Uh, I'm not. I'm the wrong guy to ask for converters on a 2021 L86. Talk to the guys at Brian Tooley. They'll they'll know. And I wouldn't suggest a stage four cam in that. You can get pick that 220 cam that they sell. That's a much better choice, and you'll get a lot of power.
Uh, C sharp, is it too big for what? What are you trying to do? What is the intake manifold? What is the intention for the motor? What, what are you doing with it? Are you, I hope that that's not, okay, it's a forged bottom end, so you have uh, pistons that have valve reliefs. That's, you'll need them with that camshaft, I think. The aluminum heads that Brodix makes are for a 4.3 liter. Five sixteenths. Oh, so they are, but it's a, it's a, but oh, five sixteenths by 18. Like what's the thread pitch? Yeah, Charles, we plan on grinding the snout down and I, I that might be overkill anyways, but you know, if you're going to do it. The, uh, you have a lot of things there, Ahmed. Just need to know the inducer and exducer diameters of both the compressor and the turbine to give you an idea. If it's a 69 millimeter turbo, that's like a GT45. It's like a 700 or 750 horsepower turbo. Yeah, the 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 bolts are really small. I've already put a 516 in there. I just don't know if I got the thread pitch right. It's a fine thread. Um, Tyler, Q usually makes more power. And I, I don't know if I've run tests on, I, we have run C16. Q is pretty nasty stuff. You don't want to touch it. Yeah, I haven't done it, Paul. I haven't done a lot of testing on Cleveland's. Done some, but not nearly enough to write a book on it. No, Dan, I haven't measured valve drop, but I was going to ask somebody, maybe the guys from ZZP, if they knew how much cam would actually fit in there. I haven't measured it. Because we're going to, we're going to, the other thing I want to change is I'm going to mill the head a little bit, and I also am going to change the, gasket. We're going to put an MLS gasket on before we do the big bang on it. Their stage five cam is a 230-224. Why would they, why do they have smaller exhaust duration? I won't be going that direction. The 3800 already has headers on it. Yeah, we've, We've measured valve drop many times, Dan. I've never run anything with nitromethane. A fourth gen Ram engine. I've run a 5.7 um, Hemi that had variable cam and a dual runner intake. I've tried to get a hold of the guys at uh, both at ZZP and Intense, and I wasn't able to get a hold of anybody, so I don't know.
Yeah, Ben, guys like to do those single patterns or even reverse patterns on turbos, and I don't think that that's a good idea. David, a lot of the problems with guys running MLS gaskets is that they didn't get the surface finish right on the head and or the block. Yeah, Gene, 600 horsepower in that car would be pretty fast. Yeah, a lot of guys, what they'll want to do is, um, you know, because everybody's running, they've been running those Felpro gaskets or the factory replacement deals all the time, and they just take that gasket off. Maybe they scratch it like I do with a razor blade and put an MLS gasket on there, and that doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, it might work okay, but it's, it's not going to work, no matter how much copper spray you put on it. Your, um, Admiral, your 462 valve should have come with MLS gaskets from the factory, right? What's the simplest to tune? I don't, it depends on what you know and what you don't know. The, the I like the Holly because it's pretty user friendly, but I've spent a lot of time on it. Five hundred twenty-eight to the wheels on an Audi. That's be nice. Tim, I think that. <coughs> Tim, I think that they're worried about all the boosts blowing out the exhaust. Yeah, Aaron, any any kind of coating that you put on the gasket, if it helps fill in or surface irregularities, that's what they're trying to do. And paint can do that, it, you know, if you put it on before it dries. <laughs> 275 on sportsman heads, that's pretty good. Okay, guys, two more minutes. <laughs> Did someone say Porsche? I knew that would wake you up, Dan. I'm also kicking around the idea of putting a different kind of blower, adapting a different kind of blower on the 3800. And I do happen to have a 2.8 liter Kenny Bell. Should be more than enough size, right, for a 3800? Charles, thank you very much. Uh, Ahmed, I run. We run LS9 gaskets on the um, on all on all of the later Big Bang stuff. They all had LS9s on on the. The one that made 1500 horsepower, that was, those were LS9 factory gaskets. <laughs> 1471. I don't know if it needs that.
Uh, 3H18, okay. That's what it is? Okay. So I have bolts. Chad, I did run a Kenny Bell long ago on an L67 when I was back when I was with Rammer Technology, but it was a smaller one though. I'm thinking it was a, you might remember, it might be a 2.1 or 2.2, I think. Um, it wasn't really big, it made decent power, but we still had a stock cam in it, which I now wish I would have put something else in there. Save the 3,800 Big Bang Fund. Nice. The TVS. I don't have any TVS blowers, though. And I have the Kenny Bell. And I also have other size Kenny Bells. I, I have a um, I have an N112 from an 03 Cobra that owns house. And it has the intercooler. But it's it doesn't package very well. The the adapter plate would have to be really big for it to fit the intercooler. I think that the LS3 one might work out better. Um, and plus it's a 2.8 liter blower. It's big. Paul, what's going on? Thank you very much. Yeah, I just saw the, Tim, I just saw the um, thumbnail for that thing on the ball honing. I, I've used ball honing a lot and works fine. Do you see the, the bottleneck being the heads? I think that the high heads are not ideal for what we're doing, but I think that the I think that the internal strength of the motor is what we're going to get to. Something either a piston or a rod. I'm guessing it's just we're going to have to run a lot more boost to do it. <laughs> the PSI blower, yeah, that's what it needs. I'll have to, add, Mike, I'll have to ask Mark Sanchez if he has a 2.2. He might have one over there because he's got some kits, some early 5-liter kits. But I think that those were small. I think those were 1.5s. So it's a 3.818, right? Is that what you're thinking? I'm on here a lot more than an hour. <clears throat> Tim made a good point. This will be the last comment for tonight. I um, he was talking about putting a torque plate on there when you hone it. Um, I don't ever do that when I do a ball hone because we're doing it here at the shop. Sometimes I don't even take the piston out. So that we're not going to do that. But I did make one for my B series stuff um, so that we could do the machining properly because we the places that we were taking him to get it done didn't have that. So uh, I didn't make it. The guys, you know, Mahovitz, <laughs> my go-to guy, um, made that for me. So you could bolt, bolt, bolt it on there and, you know, do it correctly. Five, 16, 18. Cool. Thanks, Ben. All right, we'll see you guys later. Thank you all for showing up and supporting the channel. Uh, hopefully, I should be able to get this motor up and testing, and we'll try to do some maybe flow testing and have some numbers up. Thanks for showing up. See you tomorrow.